Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and I would like to welcome you to the fourth lecture in the summer 2020 offering of GPU programming for video games. So in the last lecture, we looked at transforming three-dimensional coordinate systems to other three-dimensional coordinate systems. In particular, we looked at the world transformation that would take objects from the model coordinate system that your artist used into the world system likely used by your level designers and your game logic. We also looked at the view transformation that takes into account the location and orientation of the camera. Once we're in that view space, we need to take the objects in the scene and project them onto your two-dimensional computer screen. There's several approaches to this. There's rarely used but fancy schemes out there, but most games are going to be using either orthographic or perspective projection. In this lecture, we're going to look at orthographic projection, the simpler projection, and this will set us up to discuss perspective projection in the next lecture. The job of this final set of vertex transformations is to map a three-dimensional volume into a normalized volume, often called clip space, that is expected by the remaining bits of hardware that actually perform the rasterization and turn your triangles into sets of pixels. Different APIs will use different approaches. The one I'm shown here is used by Direct3D, and this is a fairly difficult diagram to interpret. I have the axis here, this XY axis, at the Z equals zero plane. That's the same plane that this part of the cube is sitting at. So this is actually sitting at Z equals zero as well. This is difficult to see. Your brain is probably going to want to put this in the middle of the cube, but really this point is sitting here on the face of the cube, and you should imagine that all of the cube that you're seeing is extending into the background and not towards you at the viewer. The location of the triangles will be determined by the X and Y coordinates. The Z coordinate isn't as important in positioning the triangle, but it is used to figure out what objects are in front of other objects, which we'll look at a few more lectures from now. And also this depth information is often used by a lot of post-processing effects, such as focusing effects like depth of field and things like fog. I should also mention that the vast majority of this discussion was taken from this excellent article by Joe Farrell. So I've taken the diagram from the previous slide and copied it. All of the conventions for clip space that I'm aware of are ultimately left-handed systems. They have positive Z values moving away from you, although they do switch around in different ways. So although Direct3D is inherently a left-handed system, the XNA framework that Microsoft built on top of it used a right-handed system in its eye space, which you could also call the view space or the camera space. So X and A switches from right-handed to left-handed in this clip space transformation that we're going to look at, whereas Direct3D keeps the same handedness. And there's a similar strange thing that happens over here if we look into the OpenGL or the Unity standard. The main difference between what you see on the left and what you see on the right is the way Z is handled. So both of the systems have X and Y going from minus one to one. But what's happening with Z is different. As I mentioned on the last slide, it's kind of difficult to visualize what's happening in the left plane because this front of the cube here, this is actually at Z equals zero. So you should envision this point as sitting here on the front face of this cube. The OpenGL convention has Z going from minus one to one instead of zero to one. So over here, you should think about this point as actually being in the middle of the cube because Z down here is at minus one, whereas over here, it's still sitting here. It's at Z equals zero. In terms of the handedness, Unity does use a left-handed convention in its camera space, so it doesn't switch conventions while going to the clip volume. But OpenGL inherently has a right-handed convention in the eye space, aka camera space, aka view space, so it switches handedness. My initial 3D coordinate lecture, I spent a lot of time just talking about how different programs and different game engines and artist tools use different systems. Well, that keeps going. Everybody uses a different convention. And the reason I'm spending so much time on it here is that if you're reading through a book, it will often pick a particular convention and use that convention throughout. 
but it won't ever explicitly state or at least not make a big deal about what particular convention it's using, which can make it difficult when you start reading other books or blog articles or looking at source code or whatever. So the orthographic projection that we're going to look at is one of the simplest modes. Here we're just going to assume that there's a set of parallel lines running from the scene to the viewer. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick a plane in space and we're going to project certain things in the scene onto those particular points. There may be objects that are partially outside of the scene. And in this case, usually there's part of the hardware, or if it is a software render, part of the software, that will take certain triangles that are on the edge. It will do an intersection check. So it will take triangles that are sitting, say, partially outside of your volume, and it will split those up into smaller triangles as needed for the parts of the object that are within the clip space. In the next lecture, we'll look at perspective projection that takes into account the fact that in real life, objects that are closer to you are going to look bigger than objects that are farther away from you. This orthographic projection style is fairly popular in older games before you had fast 3D graphics hardware. Often they would essentially be quote unquote faking a 3D effect using what are essentially 2D tiles hand drawn by an artist. The problem with this particular kind of approach, and again, I need to give credit to the article where this graphic is drawn from, is that you can wind up with strange paradoxes trying to interpret the scene. There is actually a game a while back called Monument Valley that takes into account these kinds of paradoxes. A lot of older games such as Fallout or Avernum or Ultima 8 would use this style. So suppose we've gone through the world transformation and we've gone through the view transformation. Everything is now in the realm of the camera. We may define some points in space that define our volume that we want to render. So we'll have a left and a right coordinate, a bottom and a top coordinate, and a near and a far coordinate. What we would like to do is map this into a volume that, for example, using the Direct3D style, goes from 1, minus 1, 0, down here at LBN, up to 1, 1, 1, up to RTF. And these will be the kind of coordinates that are passed into the pixel shaders we're going to look at that have responsibility of determining the final color of a particular pixel. So the math here isn't really terribly fancy. We want to be able to map, say, in the x-coordinate left and right to minus 1 to 1. We could say we're mapping x is between L and R to x is between minus 1 and 1. So first, let's say we want to normalize things on the left. So we might subtract L from everything in this expression. And then we might divide by R minus L, the thing on the right. So this is basically the width of that initial cube. And now we have something going between 0 and 1. But to get something between minus 1 and 1, well, that's a range of 2. So let's first double everything. So I've multiplied by 2 across here. And now we can subtract 1 from everything. So I now have a number in the range of minus 1 to 1. And all I really need to do is take this minus 1 and rewrite it as r minus l over r minus l and simplify it a bit to get my final expression. The nice thing is I can write this as an affine transformation. So I've got a constant times the x coming in, and then I'm subtracting a constant from it. So that's something we can handle with homogeneous coordinates, with our four-dimensional transformation matrices, and we have a 1 sitting in that w component that we've added to our usual 3D vectors. So that was the derivation for the x-coordinate going from left to right. The derivation for the vertical coordinate, the y-coordinate going from bottom to top, is basically identical. All right, now let's think about what happens in Z. So if we're doing the direct 3D convention, that doesn't map to minus 1 to 1. We want near and far map to 0 to 1. So this derivation is a little bit shorter, actually. When we do this mapping, we'll subtract by n. That will put the left point of our Z range to 0. And then we can divide by f minus n, as we've done before. And now we can take this expression and split it up into two terms. And one of those terms is actually a multiplier on z, and the other is just a constant. And again, we can take this into account easily with homogeneous coordinate approaches. The OpenGL standard maps z to minus 1 to 1 instead of 0 to 1. 
So you can redo this transformation for that convention. It's going to look more like the transformations from the previous slide. Now, if we combine all of this together in one big matrix, if we're using a row convention, as Direct3D does, we can just place along the diagonal all of the multipliers of x, y, and z, and then this last row here handles the translation terms. Remember, if we're using a column convention, then the matrix would go before the vector, and in that case, we will be using the transpose of this matrix. So just taking that matrix and recopying it on this slide, we don't always have to program these ourselves. There are commands built into Direct3D, for instance, to compute these things for us. Direct3D has a left-handed convention, as does Unity. An interesting thing about the call you see here is that Direct3D, this is sort of a C-style framework. So we have parameters that we're passing in, but to create something like a matrix, we actually have to pass in a pointer to that matrix data. An interesting thing about the math here is that this matrix works regardless of whether you're using a right-handed or left-handed coordinate system for your z-axis. So you can have f minus n, and you could put in numbers like 50 for near and 100 for far in a left-handed system, or you could put in numbers like minus 50 for near and minus 100 for far for a right-handed system, and you wouldn't have to change any of this. So that leads to something incredibly confusing that took me ages to figure out, which is if you look in the Microsoft manual, you'll see that they actually flip the N and F in this term for the right-handed version of this call to make the right-handed matrix. X and A also has a routine built into the matrix class to make this for you, and it has the same kind of flip. So then you try to figure out what's going on, and it turns out, even if you're using a right-handed system, where the near plane in the view, aka camera, aka space, is minus 50 and the far plane is minus 100, these API calls expect your near and far planes to be listed as positive numbers, even though in the coordinate system they're really negative numbers. So they essentially do that sign flip for you. So that's why there's two different calls. That's why the left-handed version of the call has F minus N in the denominator here, and the right-handed version of the call has N minus F here. They've basically done a minus sign for you because I guess they thought it would confuse people to have to put negative numbers into here, even though they are. So you put positive numbers in here and it does the minusing for you. And yes, that is confusing. Now, there is a command in OpenGL to make this right-handed matrix because that's the convention they use. They also use positive N and F, positive near and far. The other difference here is that the Z maps to minus one to one and there's a column vector convention. So some of the scaling will be different and they use column vectors. So you'll see something that looks more like the transpose of this matrix than this original matrix. Little side point on the different calls here. Direct3D sort of has a C base. So to create a matrix, you actually have to pass in a pointer to the matrix data. XNA used C Sharp, which is a slicker object-oriented language. It can actually create and return a matrix without having to stick in this pointer. You may say OpenGL also has a C basis. How are they getting away with not having a pointer here? Well, GL has a strange stack-based computational model like the RPN calculators that Hewlett-Packard used to make. So a lot of their operations will create a matrix and shove it onto a stack that then gets popped off later. Now, it's fairly rarely the case that you need to have all of this flexibility of the left, right, bottom, top, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Usually, we can say that there is a symmetry going on. You could say the middle in your X and Y land is at 0, 0, and we'll just define a width and a height. Now, we do need to keep the flexibility of having different near and far planes. In this case, most of the APIs will have a specialized version of these calls with hopefully a shorter name and also with a smaller parameter list. So here's the left-handed version of the call, and for completeness, here's what the right-handed version. Again, 
they put this minus sign in here, even though N and F should be negative numbers, the calls, in this case, the simplified calls, are expecting positive numbers to go in, so they do the negation for you. So in the next lecture, we'll look at perspective projection, where things that are farther away look smaller and things that are closer to you look bigger. And now you see why I did not go to art school. If you are not taking GPU programming for video games with me at Georgia Tech in the summer 2020 semester, you can check out of this video now. But if you are one of my students taking it in the summer 2020 semester, I would like you to log into Canvas and there you will find a quiz. And please fill out this quiz by, let's say, Friday at 5 p.m. I want to know what other classes are you taking. This will give me a sense of what your workload is like this semester. It'll give me a sense of what you're up against. And in particular, just give me a sentence or two about how are they handling distance learning? How are they handling turning in homeworks, projects? How are they dealing with exams? Are they using some sort of proctoring solution or just going totally open book? Or anyway, how are they handling it? How are they delivering content to you? Are they making you show up for live lectures that are being live streamed? Are they recording ahead of time and trying to edit the video to make a polished experience like I'm doing for you here? How are they handling office hours? Are the professors and our TAs showing up for a text chat at certain times that you can type questions and they can answer? Or are they showing up at various times on something like blue jeans? Anyway, I would like your perspective on these things.